I don't wanna be Just someone that's new I speak my mind so free So you could hear the truth Yeah, I know that we all have Hello and welcome to the Truth For Youth podcast. I am your host, Micah Murphy. Thank you for listening in. Well, happy belated Easter. Yes, I know it's after Easter and I meant to do a podcast before Easter about Easter, but man, with all the the COVID-19 pandemic happening and me being new to podcasting, it honestly just passed me before I realized, hey, I, I missed it. You know, I didn't get the Easter podcast in beforehand, so I'm going to do it now. And I feel like it's okay because guess what? Easter shouldn't be celebrated just once a year. Now, I know technically on the calendar, it's only once a year, but really we're celebrating Easter. The meaning of Easter should be on a daily basis, right? We're celebrating the fact that Jesus rose from the grave. That's what we're celebrating, and that's something that we should be excited about and talk about all the time. And honestly, it's one of my favorite topics, so I'm excited about being able to talk about it today. And I'm going to give you, hopefully, some some good ammunition that you can use in defending your faith and even, you know, caring for that you could use to witness and share with others that maybe don't believe. So we're going to go back to the whole idea of Jesus dying and coming back from the dead. Now, I believe that this is the greatest event to ever have happened in the history of the world. Now, I know in the very first podcast, I said I was going to talk about truth, and if I ever stated that it was something of my opinion, I would let you guys know. Well, this is something that it's of my opinion. It's not, I guess, verifiable or proof or whatever, but just I believe that the fact that Jesus defeated death and came back from the dead is the greatest event ever, ever. Why? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today. So hopefully by the end of the podcast, you're going to see at least my viewpoint. I'm not trying to convince you that you should believe that. That's not what the the whole purpose of this podcast is. But I'm going to share with you, you know, some different things about it. And then at the end, you'll see at least my viewpoint as to why I believe it's the most important. Now, I was sitting there thinking, if if you were to ask a bunch of people, what is the greatest event? You know, what what would people say? And I think people would say all sorts of different events if you were just to say, hey, what is the greatest event to have ever happened in the world? You know, I think we would have uh, things like people would probably say maybe the Civil War, maybe the Revolutionary War, maybe it was one of the great world wars, um, perhaps the Renaissance, maybe the Industrial Revolution, um, maybe it was the, uh, the birth of Jesus or the Digital Revolution. You know, there's a bunch of different things that have happened throughout the history of the world that it, no doubt has had a great impact on the world and has forever changed the trajectory of human, you know, humankind. But today, again, we're going to focus on the fact that Jesus came back from the dead because no one else has ever done that, right? So that's a pretty, uh, pretty important thing. So why am I saying that? It's so important. Well, I think Paul said it best. So we're, I'm going to read you what Paul said, well, how he wrote it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 14 through 19. This is what he says. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that God raised Christ from the grave, but that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, All who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope is in Christ only for this life, we are more 
to be pitied than anyone in the world. So that's the way Paul has phrased it. That Christianity, everything about Christianity hinges on the fact that he comes back from the dead. If he doesn't, like Paul said, well, then all the apostles would be lying about God because they said Christ would come back from the grave. But if that's not the case, then what does he say? Our faith is useless. I mean, mean, it's, it's worthless. It's useless. And we are still guilty of our sins. Think about that. The whole fact that we believe that Jesus died for our sins hinges on the fact that he's more than a human. Because any human could get up there on the cross and say, well, I'm going to die for your sins, and they can die. But we're not forgiven of our sins unless that individual really was God, who could then truly be the perfect sacrifice. That's the, that's the whole purpose, right? Like, it had to be a perfect sacrifice. I can't go up there and die. You can't go up there and die for other people's sins because we are blemished. We are sinful. Therefore, we're not a worthy sacrifice. We can't take the place of the sin. Only Jesus, who was perfect, can do that. But if he doesn't come back from the dead, then it's saying that that we're not, you know, we're still dead in our sins. So guess what? That means we don't get everlasting life. That means we don't get to go spend eternity with God in heaven. And that's when Paul goes into saying that we're still lost, right? And that we should be pitied more than anyone. Like, oh, that that pitiful little Christian, he believed that Jesus really did come back from the grave, but he didn't. He died, and he's still dead. And that means you, believing in him, have useless, worthless faith because your sins are not forgiven. Makes sense. We should be pitied if that's the case. So that's why I go back to everything that Christianity believes hinges on the fact that we believe Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he comes back from the dead. There was a, uh, there was a disciple now that I did years ago when I was um, still in Coleman, Alabama with my uh, youth group there. And it said that we had to make a decision that Jesus was one of three things. That he was either a liar because he claimed all these things, right? He claimed to be God. He claimed that he was going to die and come back from the dead. So either he was a liar because he didn't do that, or he was a lunatic, meaning he was just a crazy guy, right? Like, We have those crazy people in our society, right? Like plenty of them. And they're just not right in the head. So you wouldn't necessarily call them a liar because they're trying to purposely deceive. They're just messed up in the head, right? Like they just, there's not connections happening that should be. And therefore they believe things that are so out there and bizarro, right? Like, you know what I'm talking about. So he was either a liar, he was, he was truly trying to deceive people and tell people he was somebody that he was not, which again, we have plenty of those people in our society as well. He was the lunatic, that just crazy, he believed that, or he was Lord, meaning he really was who he claimed to be. And he has to be one of those three. Like every, everything can fall into those three categories. He can't be one or the other. He has to be one of those, right? So everybody has to, everybody has to make a decision. You, you got to decide which one is he. And that was the purpose of that disciple now. Are you going to decide if he's a liar, a lunatic, or Lord? But you've got to make a decision. And that's where we come back to this whole thing. Like Jesus made all these claims. And based on The resurrection, if it happened or not, kind of tells us, was he a liar? Was he a lunatic? Or was he truly Lord? So we're going to look at this. Um, 
And again, something that I want to hit on is Jesus is, is claiming that he can come back from the dead, okay? And if he does, okay, if we, we believe in the resurrection, then that distinguishes him from everyone else and every other religion out there, right? Like, like all the other world religions, they have their prophets or they have their founders or, or whatever, people that they look up to or, or whatever, right? But none of those people, right? Look at the Mormons have Joseph Smith. He didn't come back from the dead. Jehovah's Witnesses, they have Charles Taze Russell. He didn't come back from the dead. Islam has the prophet Muhammad. He didn't come back from the dead. Buddhism has uh, Siddhartha Gautama. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that, that right. You know, and so on and so on. You have all these various world religions. Guys, what distinguishes them? Those guys are all dead. They were human. They were 100% human, just like me and just like you. Jesus, however, with Christianity, not only was he 100% human, he was 100% God, and he proves that through the resurrection again. But it didn't really happen. Well, let's talk about some of the possibilities, okay? Like, what, what really happened? Now, first, I guess we need to go back to, was Jesus real? Was he a real guy? And most scholars, or pretty much all scholars, are going to tell you that, yes, he, he was a real man. Um, that he really did live. That he really did, you know, make all these claims and, and all this, okay? But can we be 100% certain? Can we be 100% certain that Jesus really lived? Can we be 100% certain that Jesus died by crucifixion, that he, you know, came back from the dead? Can, can we believe with 100% certain? Well, let me ask you this question. Can you believe with 100% certainty that George Washington lived? Can you believe with 100% certainty that man really did walk on the moon? Why don't you say, well, yeah. But think about that. Are you 100% sure? Or did you just read about that? Or did someone just tell you about that? Or we were just supposed to study that in school? If you really think about it, it's hard to be 100% certain about anything. Unless we were there to physically experience it. Now, none of us living today... We were not alive at this time, so we were not there to experience any of those things that I just talked about. Well, besides walking on the moon, but none of us were there in the space shuttle to see that, to witness that, right? We just heard about it maybe or, or watched a video of it. But it's pretty interesting if you watch some YouTube videos and some other stuff like how that could be recreated in a Hollywood studio. So, you know, I don't know. I'm not saying we did or did not. I'm just saying that there's enough evidence out there that will put a little bit of a doubt in your mind. And that's what I'm getting to. If there's a little bit of a doubt, which means you're not 100% certain. And again, we were not there. So for all these events that we study in history books and all this other stuff, how do we know those things? Well, we have to, since we weren't there firsthand experience, what's the next best thing? Contacting other eyewitnesses, right? Talking to other people that were there that experienced it. And that's how you get history, right? That's how history books are written and documentation. Hopefully, the better history that we have, the better documentation is coming from eyewitness accounts. Right, that's why we see on the news, you know, they always interview people that witnessed that accident or that tragedy or that miracle or whatever, because you're getting eyewitnesses to talk about that event, things that they actually saw or heard or experienced. Same thing in the court, right? When someone's being, you know, on trial for something, they try to bring in eyewitnesses because that's the more critical pieces, the people that have eyewitness experience. All right, so now let's jump to the possible explanations. What are some possible explanations? Well, some say that it's all legend, right? It's just a legend. Um, 
Jesus himself, ah, you know, that's just something that we read about and, you know, and learn or hear or whatever. It didn't really happen, right? It's kind of like stories that kids and grandkids, you know, have heard over the years. The next one is a fraud. Some people say it's a fraud, okay? <clears throat> yeah, Jesus uh, died by crucifixion, but the whole body, you know, it was it was stolen or it was hidden. It was just a big fraud that those disciples... They didn't want anybody to think that they were crazy, so they they stole the body or whatever, right? It was just a big fraud. Some people say it was the wrong tomb, that that's why Jesus' body wasn't theirs, because people kept going to the wrong tomb, which, you know, seems okay. Well, that that may be a, a possibility if, if maybe Jesus was buried somewhere else, all right? What about apparent death? That's another popular one. So, so Jesus was beaten and, you know, flogged and all that stuff that happened. And he was on the verge of death, maybe even went into a coma, right? So it, it seemed like he was dead. So when they put him in the tomb, which the tombs at that time were really like holes in a cave, right? Or holes in the side of a mountain or something or ground, where it wasn't necessarily buried under the ground like we think of, okay? So it was a, it was a tomb, it was like a, maybe a cave or something, and a rock was rolled in front of it. Well, that was the wrong one, right? So Jesus was actually in a different one. That's why his body wasn't there. And then another popular one is hallucinations. Now, hallucination is when someone perceives something, um, but that it's not real, right? Like, it's just a hallucination. It's a, like a projection of the mind, if you will. You know, like you think of people on hallucinatory drugs. They, they envision all these things, and it's not real. Like it's the drugs making you think that way or see those things. So people were just hallucinating about seeing the, this resurrected Jesus because, again, when Jesus came back from the dead, people— said that they saw him, that they had encounters with him, right? That they talked to him, they saw him, interacted with him. Um, then there's a delusion, right? That these disciples or these people that saw that, they were delusional, which is very similar to hallucinations. But this is when someone believes something that's false despite the evidence, right? Like, you know, they're delusional that, you know, some people may be like schizophrenic, right? They believe that someone's after them and they're they're convinced in their mind when, you know, reality says, no, no one's, no one's really chasing you. No one's really hunting you down and watching you 24 hours a day. That's just, they're a little delusional. Okay. So that's, that's another one. And then obviously we're coming to number seven, which is the resurrection. And that's the one that I'm believing. That's the one that I think makes the most sense. And we're going to talk about kind of each of those and some evidence and see why I believe that's the best one, and hopefully by the end of this podcast, if you're not convinced, then maybe you will be convinced. Now look, I'm the first to say that Christianity is not one of those religions that's based on scientific evidence. It's more of a faith, right? Like we're having faith in God, we're having faith in Jesus. But if there was, you know, verifiable evidence, scientific evidence that proved all the things in the Bible wrong— then that should be a concern. But that has not happened. And the cool thing is that science continues to find evidence that pretty much verifies what the Bible is saying and those historical documents were actually true. Now, this is a little thing that I'm going to go through, and, and it's really called apologetics. And for those that are not sure what apologetics is, that's just defending your faith, okay? This was something that I studied when I was in seminary. Uh, I went to seminary in New Orleans, Baptist Theological Seminary, and I took several classes on apologetics, which is really defending your faith. And you get to look at evidence that exists and different theories, and look, I, I'm not you know, one of these top apologists, theologians, you know, can go and debate with the world's best atheists or anything like that. But I got to study under some great ones, and I got to go and listen to some conferences and, and read and study some of the great works that, that some of the great ones are out there. Bob Stewart, uh, Mike Lacona, um, Gary Habermas, they're all uh, William Lane Craig, all these guys I got to hear and I got to study under. And honestly, it became a passion of mine. So I love 
apologetics. So the material that I'm about to share with you is something that I learned when I was in seminary. So I can't take credit for this great, massive work, uh, but I'm going to give credit where credit is due. And, and the, the main ones that I'm going to talk about today actually come from uh, Mike Lacona and Gary Habermas. They did an amazing um, study, you know, research on the resurrection of Jesus. And so I'm able to take some of what they've learned and what they've studied, and I'm going to share that stuff with you. All right, so here's the thing. If we're looking at evidence, okay, we've got to look at facts. So if we cannot be 100% certain that an event happened in history, what do you do? We'll go back to what I just said earlier. We have to look at the evidence. We have to look at the eyewitness accounts. Now, of all the scholars, the experts in the field of study that have studied Jesus and have studied the resurrection, they're going to tell you that there are certain facts that exist, that there's just no question, okay? The top three are that Jesus really did die by crucifixion, that that's not even a doubt, that's not even, you know, whatever. Like even non-believers, non-Christians that do not buy into the whole Jesus thing, the ones that have studied this, they tell you that that is a true fact in history. There's enough evidence that says that there was a man named Jesus and he really did die by crucifixion. All right, there's another one that um, Jesus appeared to several people, right? That he appeared to a guy named Paul. Now, Paul was an enemy of Jesus. Okay, so what they're saying is they're not saying that, yes, Jesus definitely appeared to him, but they're saying that, that Paul believed that he had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus, that he believed that. So that's what they're saying. They're not saying that, yes, that's a definite fact. Okay, so hopefully you understand that. But they're, the experts are saying that he, Paul, the, the man Paul, he was a legit guy also in history, and he hated Christians, and he had this uh, transformation that happened after what he believed was an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. Um, and that Jesus' disciples, they too believed that they had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. Okay, so this is similar to the other one, but it's the fact that they believed. Okay, so they're not saying that they, they did actually see resurrected Jesus. I'm just trying to make that clear because that can be kind of confusing. All right, so those are three facts that like 99% of all the scholars say are true about this whole Jesus, okay? And then we're going to start piecing things together now. Um, but I'm going to give you two more that 75% of the scholars say is actually true, okay? And that is that there was an empty tomb and that James who was the half-brother of Jesus, he was skeptic. He was a skeptic of Jesus being the Savior, but all of a sudden he changed when he had what he believed was an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. All right, so those are five facts that 75% of all the scholars that are studying this, Christian, non-Christians, are saying are actual historical events. So now what we have to do is take the evidence and try to say, based on that evidence, this is the most plausible theory for those events. Now, let's look at some of the things that we talked about in the beginning. I went through some of the most popular beliefs about the resurrection of Jesus, like what actually happened. And I talked about seven. Six that were against it, the seventh one being the resurrection. So let's kind of take each one of these and look at it a little bit more specific. All right, so if it was just legend, just a legend that Jesus, you know, was this prophet, Messiah, or whatever, that he claimed all these things, but he didn't really, he didn't really do those things, right? Because it was just a legend. Well, we go back to some of those facts. The, the very first fact is that there really was a man named Jesus, and he really did die by crucifixion. So it it can't be legend. Now, the part about the resurrection maybe could be, be legend, but Jesus himself was not just a legend, right? He was a legit individual. 
What about fraud? A lot of people believe this one. So let's talk about this one a little bit. So fraud. All right. So you have these disciples, right? They were following Jesus. They, they had given up their, their livelihoods, you know, they'd given up their, their careers and they began following Jesus everywhere he went. They, they believed him. They lived with him and did life with him. And now all of a sudden he's taken into custody He's beaten and whipped and, and just humiliated and then sacrificed on a cross. So now you have these disciples where their leader's gone, and now they're like, uh-oh, what, you know, what do we need to do? Like, this was our leader. We look bad. We claim that he was the Messiah, but yet he just died, right? And he looks human, and now we're left without anything. So let's see if they can pull off this massive fraud, right? So at this point, there's 11 disciples because the 12th, Judas, you know, commits suicide. So now there's only 11. So these 11 individuals have got to pull off a pretty amazing feat, all right? They've got to steal the body, and then they've got to go on with their lives and never tell anybody what they've done. Now think about this. In the history of all the, the various frauds and schemes and scandals, someone always squeals, right? Like someone always spills the beans. Someone always talks. It just never happens where everyone goes to the grave with the same secret. It just doesn't happen, right? Like, you know, the police love to, to turn one against the other when they're investigating a, a crime or something. It's like, hey, you know, you get only, you get to go free, or maybe you only get the, a shortened sentence of only like six months if you'll speak and tell us who all was involved. And almost always someone talks, right? You can look at the mob, you can look at the mafia, gang members, uh, political schemes that have happened, you know, Watergate, all that stuff. Like it just, someone always talks. So you're telling me that these 11 guys were able to pull off this fraud and no one ever talked. Now, that's hard to believe, but now let me throw something on top of it. These guys were tortured and beaten, thrown in jail, and killed for, for this fraud, if it's a fraud. Now, I don't know about you, but I can, I can pull off a you know, maybe a joke or a scheme or something to some extent. But the moment someone starts, you know, A, to throw me in jail, or B, they start beating me and whipping me and stoning me and going to behead me, I'm talking, buddy. I'm going to tell you, okay, 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 it was just a joke or it was just a fraud. Like, that is not, that did not really happen, right? Now, for one or two of those people to go, to die for a fraud? Maybe. All 11? No, no way. No way. It's just hard to believe. And again, okay, so if it was a fraud, that maybe they stole the body, why does Paul, who's an enemy of Jesus, who hated Christians and likely killed Christians, why would he all of a sudden start saying that, no, 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 I had this encounter with the resurrected Jesus, and then he devotes his entire life to tell everybody about Jesus, and he too dies and gets beaten, thrown in jail, and all that stuff. Why would he go through all that if the disciples were the ones that pulled off a fraud? Look, just because a tomb is empty and just because, you know, whatever, that's not enough for Paul to believe. Paul believed because he had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus. All right, there's the wrong tomb theory, okay? So that, I think we pretty much have, have killed the fraud theory. Now let's go the wrong tomb. Okay, so they put Jesus' body in the wrong tomb, or the people looked in the wrong tomb, one of the two. That sounds good on the surface, but that's not why people change their lives. That's not why Paul, again, Paul... Paul doesn't care if the tomb is empty. He could be like, okay, so some thieves stole the body or whatever, or it's the wrong tomb or whatever. Again, an enemy of, of Jesus, 
He only believed because he had an encounter with the resurrected Jesus, and he was like, I was wrong. You know, this man came back from the dead. I believe. I believe. So, that's a whole different ballgame. Now, let's look at apparent death. And again, James was the same way. James was a skeptic on the, on, the, on the wrong tomb, so it doesn't work just for Paul. It's for James as well. Apparent death. Well, we go back to the very first thing that we said. The very first thing that we said was Jesus really died by crucifixion. There, there's not an apparent death. Okay, so that can be ruled off based on the very first one. And again, if you think about it, okay, so let's say Jesus was in a coma and whatever, and let's say he really did come back, you know, he, he comes to, he wakes up, he moves the stone out of the way or whatever, and he gets out of the tomb, and then he starts appearing to everybody. What would people be saying? They would be saying, oh, dang, Jesus is messed up. We got to get him to a hospital, right? We got to get him to some doctors. We got to get him patched up. Look at the, the blood loss. Look at the, the bruises and the beatings and the broken bones or whatever. We got to get this man, we got to get this man healed up. No, they saw a glorified body. They didn't see a nearly dead Jesus. They, they bowed down. They, they praised him. They worshiped him. They knew because it looked different. I mean, they looked Obviously, it was still Jesus because they recognized him, but it wasn't a half-dead, almost-dead Jesus. It was a glorified Jesus. Now, let's look at hallucinations, right? This is when someone, again, perceives something um, that is present when it's not, right? Like, you think you see it, but it's really not there. Okay, so maybe one or two people hallucinated that they saw Jesus, but you know what? Jesus showed himself to over 500 people, over 500 people. So let's say you had a group of people that were all strung out on drugs and they started hallucinating. They're not going to hallucinate about the same thing. Maybe one or two of them would, but I doubt that. But even if that one or two of them did, you're going to tell me that over 500 people hallucinated the same exact thing? Hallucination? No. No, that, that it, hallucination is individual. And that's kind of very similar to delusion, right? So that's the last one that we're looking at as far as possible explanations. If someone is delusional, again, the delusions are individual as well. So you're not going to have all these people that are all delusional. All, all disciples are delusional. They're all hallucinating the same thing. It just doesn't hold up. And again, why in the world... Would James, who was a skeptic, why would he be hallucinating about this? Why would he be delusional about this? Paul, an enemy, why would he be hallucinating? Why would he be delusional? It just it doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. And if there are hallucinations and delusions about Jesus appearing to them, Jesus' body would still be in the tomb. But it's not. So it doesn't account for the tomb being empty, unless you start trying to combine all these different theories, and then it's just crazy. Someone stole the body, and there was hallucinations, and there was fraud. Once you start piling theory on top of theory, it loses validity and reliability very, very quick. So if you look at all the different facts, I challenge you to come up with a theory that takes all those into consideration. You can't do it. I've tried. Other people have tried. There's just no plausible theory that takes all five of those facts into consideration other than Jesus is who he claimed to be. Jesus really did come back from the dead. He really was the resurrected Messiah. Now, if that's the case then that changes everything, right? Like I said earlier, no other religion has had that. So if Jesus is in fact that, then that means he was 100% man, 100% God, that he really could die for our sins. Therefore, we really are saved from our sins and we really can have everlasting life and that everything Jesus claimed and said is truth. Again, 
That's why this podcast is the truth for youth. It is biblical truth. What Jesus claimed was true. Now, here's the neat thing about all these things that I just said. You don't have to believe the Bible to believe all these things. Like I said, some of those experts, they're not Christians. So the very first thing that you say, oh, well, I believe that Jesus is who he claims is because of the Bible, or I believe Jesus resurrected from the dead because of the Bible. Well, they're going to say, well, I don't believe in the Bible because I'm not a Christian. So here's the neat thing. There was other historical documents that documented all these things. There was Clement of Rome. There was Josephus. There was Tacitus. And in the last two, Josephus and Tacitus, they weren't even Christians. They were just historians in the late first and second century who wrote about these things. So it's not just a Bible thing. And that's the awesome news for other Christians. We don't have to be solely dependent on the Bible. We can be uh, confident in our faith because there's other historians that wrote about Jesus and wrote about his miracles and wrote about the events uh, of his life and that we can believe because of other evidence. And that is the awesome thing. But it goes back to what I said. Look, Christianity is not meant to be a scientifically proven religion. It's meant to be faith-based, right? We have to have faith. We don't tangibly see God. We, we can't tangibly touch God or Jesus. Not now, maybe back then, but we can't now. So we have to have faith and believe that he is who he claims to be. And I don't know about you guys, but I know in my life, there's just things that I've experienced and things that I know that God is real. Even if I don't have all this evidence, even if I wasn't you know, studying apologetics and didn't know about this stuff, I know from my own personal beliefs and experiences that God is real. He's done some remarkable things in my life. He has touched me. He has changed me. He has, I've felt his presence uh, by the Holy Spirit in multiple ways, and you just cannot deny that. I cannot deny that anyway. And I know others believe the same thing. Look, what I want you to do with this material uh, a, I hope you keep this podcast, download it, save it, go back, listen to it a couple times. Um, I, I teach my students this all the time because I want them to understand this. I want them to remember this because this is great historical evidence. And you can share this with anybody. So somebody that says they don't believe in the resurrection of, you know, of Jesus, give them, these fi- give them these facts and say, okay, these are the facts. They're not my facts. They're not Christian facts. They're facts that the experts say. You tell me, what, how, do you, how do you account for all these facts? You tell me the best answer. You tell me the best explanation and see what they come up with. They cannot come up with a better explanation. So you can use this in defending your faith, but you can also use this in witnessing. Man, I got to use this one time I was... Uh, uh, I was actually coming back from uh, class. I was actually coming back from seminary in Birmingham late one night. I was driving back to uh, to Coleman, and I'm not going to go into the full detail of the story, but I went up picking up this hitchhiker. I did not want to, but I just really felt God saying, you need to pick this man up. So I actually turned around on the interstate, drove back, you know, late one night, picked up some random stranger. Do not encourage you guys to do that, but I picked him up. And I uh, started taking him. You know, I took him like an hour because I had like an hour drive. So I took him as far north as I was going. But during our talk, it was neat that our conversation opened up and I used this very thing to share Jesus with him because he started saying, well, I don't know. How can you believe that stuff? And I said, well, you know, there's actually some pretty cool evidence out there. And he's like, really? Like what? And I started sharing with him. It's like it just got opened the door. And I knew that there, there was a purpose for God, you know, bringing me to this man and taking this man. And so I shared with this, this with the man. And, you know, I don't, I don't know what happened to that individual, um, but I shared this with him, and he seemed pretty amazed, and he was pretty thankful. Um, so, again, you can use it as a witnessing tool also. Guys, but I just want you to try to equip you. I want you to have confidence if you're a Christian. I want you to have even more confidence And Jesus really was who he said he was. So that should make you a stronger faith-based Christian. Uh, Again, tools that you can use in, you know, if you have a discussion with someone else that maybe is not a Christian. 
you know, ask them about, well, how do you make, you know, how do you account for all these facts? You know, what's the best explanation? And you can also use it as a witnessing tool. So guys, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. Again, uh, you would do me a huge favor by subscribing and downloading this podcast. Be sure to leave a little review if you are watching or listening on iTunes. I'm also making the videos available on YouTube, so you can go to my channel, Micah Murphy on YouTube, and watch the uh, the podcast there if you prefer just to kind of watch it. So I encourage you guys to, to like it, share it with those that, that you think may benefit from it. I greatly appreciate it. People, I love you. Uh, Stay strong during this pandemic. I know it's still tough. Life's difficult right now. I get it. I get it. I get it. Uh, But this is a great opportunity for you to to strengthen your faith, continue to pray, ask God for help, for guidance during this time. And I believe all this will come to an end soon and we'll be back to doing life together. Until then, guys, stay focused on Jesus. I love you. If I can do anything for you, please let me know. And we will see you guys in the next episode. Bye-bye. I don't want to be just someone that's new. I speak my mind so free so you could hear the truth. Yeah, no.